I'm curious to know, why did you decide, as a new person, uh, understanding that you were probably under probation, meaning your first you know, 30, 60, 90 days, whatever, why, would, why, why was this so important for you to literally put your career on the line at such a young age uh, it's in so new at the post? There was no reason not to. The industry at the time um, served a lot of black people who, no, let me put it like this. I was fortunate enough to, um, uh, to have as a father-in-law a man who was, um, who was in the black press. He worked as the Washington bureau chief for the Pittsburgh Courier. And this was at a time when the black press was, was, was pretty significant and, um, and pretty important. Um, so there, it wasn't that there weren't any black journalists. It was that uh, they weren't being used very well. Um, what was irritating to me was that you could get into a mainstream newspaper but you couldn't go very far. You were limited in, 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 in the areas in which you were allowed to, um, to pursue your, your, your trade. Um, I thought that that was significant enough for, for us to, to make that demand to the Washington Post and to, and to make that criticism of them. I want to talk, I'm going to get to fake news. I want to talk about this current president because I think he is relevant in the context of, of the press. But I also want to remind all of us about the EEOC complaint that you all filed in 1972, hence the press conference. Um, let's just look at this picture for a second. I mean, what were you thinking? Um, what were you saying and what were you trying to convey, presumably not only to Ben Bradley and Catherine Graham at the Washington Post, uh, but to tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people um, around the country? I, I'll start, and this is, this is something we haven't mentioned. It, with all that context I gave you, the other part of that context is we're all baby boomers, which means we're out to change the world. You know, that's why we became journalists. We were going to change the world. And we had seen kids our age march through fire hoses and march through police dogs in Montgomery and in other places. You know, we saw people being shot, you know, because they were fighting for voting rights in the South. We were out to change the world. Frankly, that hadn't changed a lot. And we became journalists so we could change the world. And we can't picket, we can't protest. That's the stuff that we cover. But given where we worked, that's where we were going to make a difference. Can I, I I'm going to go back for a second. You, you actually touched on something else. I mean, how can you be objective when you see people that look like you are hosed out in Montgomery and Silva? How can you be objective? I'm just asking the question. No, I understand. For me, it's about fairness. That's why you, it's about fairness and it is about accuracy. Could you be fair covering Governor Wallace in 1972? I could be fair covering a Ku Klux Klan rally. Could you? Or a Nazi rally. Could you? Because that's what yeah. you have to we do. All, we, that's we, what you we, do. Yeah, well, that's, okay. that, that's what our training was. Okay. Our training. Um, none of us, except for Scoop later on, were opinion writers. Okay. We covered the news. So we went out and so saw David, what happened. So if David Duke came to this room right now and had something to say, you all think objectively you could cover him? Oh, in, 1970, yeah. in 1971, I was a reporter at the, at the Atlanta Constitution. I was assigned to cover um, a rally at American Legion Post Number 1 in Atlanta. Um, and the rally was for, was for um, Lieutenant Kelly. Kelly was a, uh, an, an Army platoon leader who who led a massacre uh, of, of, of a village in, 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 in Vietnam. In Vietnam. In May Lai. Google uh, it. Yeah, Google it. Um, uh, this he is his Facebook. That's a competitor of ours. Sorry. Facebook. Just put it on the search. <laughs> he and his platoon killed uh, well over 100 people. Men, women, and children. Men, women, and children one afternoon. They were all angry because uh, the, the soldiers were angry because one of their, their, their units had been, had been massacred. So this was the Getty Get Room. Um, Callie was, was, was branded properly a war criminal. And uh, there was a trial, but there was this big rally in Atlanta, Georgia, American Legion post number one. In other words, you know, this is, this is as, as, as conservative as you're gonna get. I was assigned to cover the rally. 
I mean, I was a night reporter at the Atlanta Constitution, and when you were assigned to do things, you just went out and did it. Well, the person who was sitting, I went in, I, I, I got there probably after the rally got started, and I, I looked for the most available seat. It was on the front row. I ran in, sat down, and I was sitting, sitting, uh, sitting next to uh, Lester Maddox. Mm. Lester Maddox was, a, uh, was one of the last of the segregationist governors in, 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 the, in the Deep South. He ran blacks off from his, um, away from his, from his restaurant with, uh, with ax handles. Um, well, it wasn't because I was so brave, it was because I needed some place to sit down. <laughs> um, and I went and sat down. And I turned, sitting there next to the governor, I said, oh, good evening, governor. And he just kind of looked at me like I was crazy. I guess I was. And, and then he got up and led this, this, this rally. You did what you were supposed to do. That's what we were, like Ivan said, that's what we were trained to do. You were trained to cover, um, cover events. Uh, I, I guess Rachel Maddox uh, says, Ra Rachel Maddow says that, you know, without fear or favor. Yeah, that's what you did. You covered what was going on. Sometimes you were next to somebody who was, um, who was a bad guy. Um, it, that's what we were yeah, trained. Yeah, yeah, the issue isn't really, wasn't really uh, whether uh, you could cover something accurately. What, what the, the if issue is often news judgment, and that is, should this be covered or should this not be covered? Uh, how much how much detail should we go into? Those are the things that um, separated uh, a lot of us from other people. Um, people talk about, and I, I didn't mention it, what I'm doing now, and that is I write a column online called Journalism, Journal uh, that uh, about uh, diversity issues in the news business. And so um, uh, at the time of Trayvon Martin, there was a lot of uh, discussion about the fact that black reporters in that area just thought that was news, and a lot of white journalists did not think it was news. And so they had to go through, and uh, of course it's much easier now with social media, uh, but to put that story out there uh, to be sure that people took note of it. So that's where the difference comes in. It's not whether you can be fair, it's whether you can give attention uh, where it's due. Before we talk about today, in 2019, last question about the picture. Um, what were you thinking back in 72 when this picture was taken? Were you optimistic that uh, things would change? <coughs> were you just trying to make a difference? Were you trying to change the world? What were you truly doing? What were you thinking? I was scared to death. <laughs> of, of your job? Of yes, your, thank of your you. Safety? It, it finally occurred to me. <laughs> I was scared to death. I, you know, we had to go ben, to work that day. Ben, well. ben was yeah. going to fire all of us. <laughs> and, did, and did the Post cover it? Did your own people yes, cover the Post? Yes, cover it. And they yeah. covered it well. The interesting thing was the day before that press conference, um, oh, yeah. we, we put the, there, there used to be something called the day book. Edi assignment editors look at it and they know what events are coming up the next day. So we put our press conference on the day book. And it came across at 5.30 in the evening. And at 6 o'clock, I was getting ready to leave the office. And the metropolitan editor and the city editor grabbed me and said, we need to talk to you. I said, oh, shit, what a, you know. They've read the day book on fire. And they said, you know, we've been thinking about it, Ivan, and we want you to become an editor. And we need an answer right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, really? You guys want to talk about coincidence? Yeah, you know. So I had no thought. I said, damn, if I say no, then tomorrow they're going to say, see, we offered one of those clowns a job, and wouldn't, they wouldn't take it. So I said yes. And I left, and I went and found Scoop. And I said, you guys just screwed me, you know? Because <laughs> now I don't get to write anymore. Now I'm going to be on the desk. So I was standing there thinking, boy, you know, this has really gotten me screwed. These guys are going to all have a great career, and I'm going to be an editor with, you know, you'll never see my name again. So it sounds like you had mixed emotions. We heard what you said. You were you were scared. We were all scared. Were you scared? Uh, no, not really. I mean, we had gone through all of this, and this was sort of the culmination. And uh, it was just, in a lot of other senses, it was the beginning because we yeah. filed the suit. So now uh, of, of the complaint. So now, what happens next? We also didn't mention that we there's Cliff Alexander on the end. He was our attorney on the, on the left. On the, on yeah, the far on right. The, on the far right. Far right, far right. 
Got it. Uh, and he had been chairman of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and also secretary of the Army. So he was an expert in equal employment opportunity. And he was advising us the whole time. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we, uh, we asked for goals and timetables uh, that the Post would agree to. We wanted to negotiate over that. Um, so he knew you know, what was going on in the EEOC and all that. So you know, like I said, this was, it was the end of one stage, but it wasn't the end of the whole I thing. See. You know, so, that's, so how were we feeling? Okay, we're going to say, well, all right, now we filed, now what happens? Let's see. Right. Can, can, can I just add to that? I, I just want to sing yes. Cliff's praises for a minute. Yes. Cliff worked for <laughs> Arnold and Porter, which was one of the most prestigious law firms here. He had a great career. He took a great risk in taking us on. He is taking on people who are going against the Washington Post. This is Catherine Graham and Ben Bradley. Thank you very much. And, and, and while you know, we didn't know what a career was, right? We didn't know what a mortgage was, but Cliff did. And so really, it, it's a great harm to himself. He took us on, and he never let us down. He was really our godfather, and we will never be able to thank him enough. Well, I fully agree. The, uh, what I was thinking was that um, three of us are natives, three of the people up there were natives of D.C., and a D.C. native was expected to um, go to high school develop a typing skill up to 32 words a minute and get a job in the government and stay there with their head down for 40 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what was expected of us. Uh, either you got a job in, the <clears throat> in some government agency or you work for the post office and you got what was called a good government job. And I'm thinking at the time, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not doing what I was expected mm -hmm. to do. I was expected to, to just shut up and get a government job and, and so as I mentioned I have dozens of other questions but I want to make sure that we um, get some questions from you uh, since we're short on time yes yes sir why do you stand up tell them uh, your name Rev and uh, the department that you're in yes yeah, so my name is Muyua Bamaduro and I'm uh, one of the lawyers here uh, oh. on Facebook so the question I have is um, there's a certain narrative today saying race doesn't matter and so I'm curious as to your your, your non-black colleagues back then. One, did they see the issue? And secondly, did they support you all? And if so, how? Well, some did, and some didn't. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there were a monolith there. So we had some, some uh, in fact, there was a story uh, that uh, I think uh, Grider told me, William Grider was one of the uh, progressive reporters, and, and he met with some of the other white reporters on the uh, national news desk. And I said, well, how can we help these? These guys out, you know. These, you know, we should, we should do something. And also, I must say that the other blacks in the newsroom also were signed a letter of support for what we were doing. But anyway, so Grider and some other ones mentioned this to Bradley, and that, and he said, "You all should just mind your own business." Mm -hmm. And that was, that was the end of that. Hi, I'm Emmanuel, and uh, I report to Robert on the comms team. I paid him to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, sounded, it sounded, Robert, like you were going to go towards kind of today, right, in the, the, the media context today. You know, I noticed that uh, it's Washington Post that has their democracy dies in darkness. Yes. Um, and and I, I, I'm curious, particularly in the context of editorial judgment and objectivity, you know, what do you feel about what the uh, major papers, including the Post, the, the how, how they're covering kind of op topics of race, of racism, and these issues, um, and political issues today, um, and, and how you feel about that, whether you feel that they're making good decisions or not. <laughs> okay, all right, uh, are they making good decisions or not? Well, I think that we've come quite a ways in terms of the, of the sophistication and, and mastering of nuances um, in the media in general, uh, partly because there are so many more black reporters now, and not just in newspapers, online as well. But there are certain areas uh, that, um, where there's gonna be tension. For example, one of the big areas of tension is uh, who was responsible for Trump's victory and what were their motivations? Now, the, the running narrative was, at the time, 
the beginning that, well, you know, there's a lot of uh, working class whites and uh, uh, they didn't, couldn't, detested Hillary and uh, that's where the problem was, or uh, you consider it a problem. That's where, the, that's where his support was. But then there were a lot of black people who said, no, the race should be right up there at the top of this. And so the newspapers and the media in general had to grapple with, you know, where, how, do, how, do they, how do they assess where Trump's support was really coming from and why was it there? And that's still going on. Um, the issue of uh, whether to call Trump's statements racist or not, or, or racially charged, you know, uh, those kind of things. And that's one of the reasons why you have, um, you know, why you have uh, uh, some tensions between, and, and this is not just about African Americans. I mean, it also goes to issues of, um, of, uh, of Native Americans and Asian Americans and uh, um, who might be that, and Hispanics, Latinos. And they all have their own issues about with the media about how they're covered. So yeah, but that's why you need everybody at the table, as Bobby was saying earlier. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna answer that question in a slightly different way. We are now in the midst of one of the most historic changes in this country. The complexion of this country is literally changing. That's, this is a story of 21st century America. If you look at the kids under five in this country now, the majority of them are minorities. This country has never seen anything like that before. So while the country is going in one direction of becoming more diverse, the news media, and I mean websites, I'm talking this whole democratization of the media, is going in the other direction. You know, so we've got one United States that looks like the brave new world, and we've got many of the people covering it that look like 19th century America. I'm here to tell you that will not work because we are back, back to accuracy and we are back to fairness. Now, the growing number of websites will help that, but we are at a time when we have to talk to each other. We don't have to agree with each other, but we have to talk to each other. And I would just ask you, how are we going to talk to each other if we live in two different Americas? Amy, you had a question? Yeah, I have a question for, oh. And I'm so sorry, let me just add. So the bridge here is news sites in any way have brought people together. We have been to town squares where people come to talk. If those town squares are disappearing because they don't have everybody there, that is a huge problem. Sorry. Maybe. Hello, sorry. I'm Amy, I'm on the comms team. My question's for all of you. I know a lot of you had well, all of you have had like your own connection to the civil rights movement, the, the Black Panthers, the SLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And I was wondering what was it like to be, I guess, a youth at that time? I don't think any of us had connections. No, we weren't part. Of, we covered those. We covered those. Yeah. 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 yeah, you weren't in the Black Panthers. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <you> <laughs> right, right, right. Looks that way. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, the, so the question is, what was it like to cover those type of yeah, change? Yeah. Change organizations back then? Did any of us actually cover anything like that? No. no well, you, you, you I covered, covered the poor people's yeah. campaign. Yeah. You covered the poor people's campaign. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was um. fun. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're laughing because I, I was beaten up at the poor people's campaign. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there was there was there was a lot of it was there was it was a complicated situation because uh, black reporters were often not trusted by those organizations because you're working for you know, the White. establishment. Uh, and there were times when, I, I remember being in a situation where uh, I was at a meeting and somebody spotted me from the stage. There's a reporter! That's what everybody turned around, you know. <laughs> it's sort of what ha like what happens at Trump rallies now, actually. Um, so uh, you had that distrust from the black community. And you also had um, uh, the, the question asked by, uh, some of your white editors, you know, are you black first or a journalist first? Mm. You know, so you were sort of in the middle. Really it, it is a dumb question, <laughs> but it's, we got it anyway. Can I can yeah. I pause there for a second? Yeah. Why do you think they asked that question? Because they didn't trust you. They didn't trust, <laughs> they, yeah, they didn't, they didn't trust your ability to be able to write a fair. What, well, the editors thought that because we were black, we knew something they didn't know, mm -hmm. and they didn't trust us to to be honest stewards. Mm -hmm of the news. And that's one of the things that we were bitching about. It's like, you know, 
we're just as good as the rest of these reporters. So how did you answer that question? If, if somebody, how do you, if somebody asked you the question, my answer was that it, that's a stupid question. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I got in trouble, you know, some people for res responding, but it was, you know, what do you mean? What do you mean, am I black first or a reporter first? Yeah. I, I must say, when the women's movement started, women and reporters sort of got the same question. You know, if you talk, if you're covering a women's rally, the question was. You know, are you a journalist first? Or, we know what the noun is. The noun here is journalist, women, black, whatever, is an adjective. <laughs> um, any other questions from the audience before we spin up? Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Sure, I'm Chris with the U.S. Policy Team. Um, I'm curious to know, you, you said that your expectation was to get a good government job. What were, your fam what were your family saying about what you guys were doing? What were your parents telling you? When are you going to get a real job? <laughs> <laughs> My mother said, don't screw up the good job you have. So she was worried that I was going to do this and get fired. Were there, so seven of you all seven you in, in that photo, were there other black journalists who were not with him? Yeah, there were two. No, there were two, two, yeah. two of the. Name them out. We started out, <laughs> we started out at the Metro Nine. But as we came to this moment, uh, two of our colleagues said, no, I can't go, I can't walk that extra mile with you. Are you mad at them still? No, no. we, we were never mad at them. Why couldn't they walk? I'm just kidding. What, what was One guy the was, was uh, an incredibly religious young man who said that uh, God was his editor. She's the publisher. Okay. How do you argue with that? <laughs> uh, the, other guy was, uh, the other guy was happened to be good friends with the publisher's son. So he was Donnie Graham's buddy. So he didn't feel comfortable going to this point. The rest of us, uh, we didn't care. You know, we didn't have any, any ties to the Washington Post. Other than Tuesdays on payday. Let me answer that question. And you yeah. sort of alluded to this. There were other black people in the newsroom. They worked on the national desk. They were frankly senior to us. They were so helpful to us. They, and, and, and they asked if they could join us. We said no. We had nothing to lose. We had no mortgages. We weren't married. We didn't know what a career was. But they did. They, had, they were much more invested. And they really stood behind us in ways in which I have only come to learn now that we have become older. But Ben would go talk to the other people in the newsroom, and they backed us up. They had our backs, and that's what we needed. One last question from the audience, from Peyton. Uh -huh. Hi, my name is Peyton. I do the uh, executive branch and White House outreach here at Crime Company. Um, my question is twofold, and it could be brief, because I know we don't have time. Is one, is do you see in the current atmosphere with us now who have the lead, um, mistakes that we're making that we should be doing to engage better on these types of topics? Uh, if so, uh, what would those be? What do you mean we? Who's the we? Whoever the we, we collective we, uh -huh. to engage on these types of topics. Do you see things that maybe mistakes that you made that we're making or things that you discovered and learned over time that would be helpful for those of us engaging on these topics? Was it Frederick Douglass whose last words were agitate? Agitate, 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 agitate yeah. yeah. Thanks. The only thing I would say to you is, just remember the context of when you're, over, when you're operating in. 21st century America is about an incredible change in this country. You all are going to end up being the greatest generation this country has ever seen. Your great-grandparents saved the world by winning World War II. You know, we started to make, the baby boomers started to make this country live up to, you know, it's right, it's what it promised. But you all are going to determine whether this country goes on or not. You are going to determine whether we all just get along here because we have never seen an America that is going to unfurl the rest of this century. We just say good luck. I have, I have two more questions before we go. Um, obviously, everyone has one of these now. Even three-year-olds have this. Uh, and because of that, more and more people are becoming comfortable with the term citizen journalist. And that is if they see a Charlottesville in their neighborhood, if they see a Trayvon Martin around the corner, whatever the case may be, they have one of these to record that moment and to tell their own story. And because of Facebook and other social media uh, platforms, they have a voice. Would you consider those type of people journalists in your, in your, in your definition, in your 
from your perspective? No, I don't. No? I don't no. What are they? They're are they amateurs. just average they're citizens? They're amateurs. Yeah. Amateur yeah. citizens, right. okay. Right. I mean, the, the example of the, uh, the MAGA mm -hmm. uh, hat uh, students at, on the mall, mm -hmm. perfect example. Mm -hmm. You have the, you know, the people taking their pictures and everything, but then later on somebody else has a picture, mm -hmm. has a video, and it's true that that, that wasn't the whole story. Mm -hmm. So, okay. you know, we, we were trained. Right. And there, there, there are things that you need to know if you're going to be a journalist. And actually, that's my last question. So we, we, here we are in 2019. We have President Trump in the White House. And he is someone that openly talks about his disdain for the press mm -hmm. and openly talks about fake news. Sometimes he's right, sometimes he's wrong, in my humble opinion. Um, given that we have a president that is so engaged with the press, is that a good thing for democracy? Is that a good thing for uh, journalism overall? And by the way, I should also mention, based on my research, there are record numbers of people that are going into journalism. Uh, the, 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 the engagement that Americans have with, with media is, is in record numbers. So is that a good thing or a bad thing? Yes, it is a good thing. But I think that more important is for journalists, whatever story, to actually inform people. I mean, they're, you know, the president is supported by, it has a core of about 30% of the nation's voters who most people would say are 30% you know, too many. These are some of the dumbest people, most ill-informed people You're on that camera, there have ever been. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and once those people become really informed, I mean, I, I don't just mean know, um, know what labels to put on people, but really under, honestly understand what the hell is happening. I mean, it's certainly better than their, than their president, who may be the dumbest person I'm, I'm, I'm going to say, I have, friends, I have friends who are Trump supporters, and they are very smart. And, and I want them to be my friends, because we have other interests. It's not just about our feelings about what's going on. They are really smart people, and we just happen to, to see things differently. I think that this is the golden age of journalism. I think what is going on, it actually